directed by the Nordson Corporation Foundation. Good afternoon and welcome to the City Club of Cleveland. My name is Paul Harrison. I am a past president and current member of the City Club's Board of Directors. I'm very pleased to introduce today's speaker, Sister Carol Keehan, President and Chief Executive Officer of the Catholic Health Association of the United States. Sister Carol comes to the City Club podium at a time when health care reform continues to be a hotly debated topic and has become interwoven into the intense political debate in this general election year. More on that in a bit, but first, here's a snippet on our remarkable speaker's background. Sister Carol earned her Bachelor of Science degree in nursing from St. Joseph's College in Maryland, graduating magna cum laude. She earned a Master of Science degree in Business Administration from the University of South Carolina, and in 2000, received South Carolina's School of Business Distinguished Alumna Award. In 2009, the university honored Sister Carol as, quote, an outstanding alumna who has served others in a manner that goes beyond what is required by the individual's job or profession, end quote. Prior to assuming her current leadership position, she, she served in leadership positions at hospitals sponsored by the Daughters of Charity, an international community of women dedicated to serving the poor. Her leadership positions included 15 years as president and chief executive officer of Providence Hospital in Washington, D.C. In 2005, Sister Carol became the ninth president and chief executive officer of the Catholic Health Association. Sister Carol has served in numerous leadership roles outside of CHA, including membership on health, labor, and domestic policy committees of the United States Conference on Catholic Bishops, and a representative to the International Federation of Catholic Healthcare Associations of the Pontifical Council for Pastoral Healthcare. I'm sure that was as important as it is long in terms of the uh, description. <laughs> Her long list of awards and honors include the Cross for the Church and Pontiff bestowed by Pope Benedict XVI, the Friend of Children Award from Children's National Medical Center, Center in Washington, D.C., recognition by Time Magazine in 2010 as one of the 100 most influential people in the world, and frequent recognition by modern healthcare as one of the 100 most influential people in healthcare, including tops on the list in 2007. Sister Carol currently serves on the boards of St. John's University in Queens, New York, and the University of St. Thomas in St. Paul, Minnesota. She has received honorary doctorates from Niagara University in New York, the College of Holy Cross in Worcester, Massachusetts, St. John's University in Queens, the Catholic University of America in Washington, D.C., Marymount University in Arlington, Virginia, and DePaul University in Chicago. That, I may have left some out, but that was uh, the latest that I could find. And finally, back to the subject of health care reform. In a July 11, 2006 address, Sister Carol stated that, quote, the Catholic health ministry is proud of its long tradition of encouraging our nation to view health as a right, not a privilege, end quote and the CHA's website, which lists 15 categories of work undertaken by CHA, says on the subject of health care reform, quote, the Affordable Care Act is not perfect, but it represents a good start toward providing access to everyone, end quote. I am honored and pleased to present on behalf of the City Club of Cleveland, Sister Carol Keehan, President and Chief Executive Officer of the Catholic Health Association of the United States. Sister. Thank Paul, thank you for that very kind introduction. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. I want to thank Sister Judith Ann Karam, who leads the Sisters of Charity Health System here in Cleveland, and a colleague that I deeply respect and enjoy working with. I also want to thank Jim Foster for the invitation to speak here again today and Congresswoman Marcy Kaptur for joining us. She has been a tireless advocate for health reform and a longtime friend of the Catholic Health Association. She's also been a featured speaker at one of our assemblies, so I'm happy, very happy, to see Congresswoman Kaptur here today. And of course, thank you for all, to all of you for coming. 
It's a pleasure to be back at the City Club. When I last spoke here, it was 2008. And like now, we were in the heat of a national election. At that time, I tried to make the case that healthcare reform was not only a moral imperative, but an economic one. I argued that other industrialized nations are able to get more value for a lot less money in their healthcare systems, and by the way, cover everyone, and certainly, if that's so, we have the creativity and intelligence here in the United States to do the same or better. I explained why in my own career as a nurse, I chose to move from that into healthcare finance. I felt that by understanding the economics of the system, I would be best positioned to help change and improve it, to make sure it is accessible and affordable to all, especially those who are poor, vulnerable, and marginalized. So let's go back for a moment to 2008, before anyone heard of something called the Affordable Care Act, before Obamacare entered the nation's lexicon, before health reform was even on the political radar. The organization I lead, CHA, was making a case for health reform. Just a year earlier, we had developed a set of principles for a system that serves everyone. Our vision, as we called it, is grounded in Catholic social teaching and reflects widely held US values of justice compassion, and equal opportunity. We called for a healthcare system that first and foremost is available to all without respect to any factor other than the right of every person to receive medical treatment when they need it. We called for a system that focuses on prevention and is fairly financed. We also noted the need for quality, transparency, and accountability. As we were making our case, the sobering statistics continued to add up. With the economy shedding jobs and veering toward recession, millions of people lost health coverage. Others worried they soon would. To lose health insurance when, is one thing when you are young and healthy, quite another when you're being treated for cancer or another serious illness and suddenly find yourself on your own. To leave these people to fend for themselves in the expensive maze that our healthcare system is, is a national shame. It is something we had to correct if we were to be a nation that respects life and human dignity while stewarding its resources wisely and morally. In 2008, and even today, nearly 50 million people continue to lack any meaningful health insurance. According to our US Census Bureau, millions more are underinsured, finding their policies to be inadequate when they get sick or their child is hospitalized. We know that the elderly poor often make choices between food and medicine, that people in desperate need of health coverage are rejected because of a pre-existing condition. You're probably well aware of these facts, but I include them as a reminder of the scope of our challenge, and as a reminder that when we talk about millions of people uninsured, it is easy to let a big number obscure each of the individual stories. The family with two working parents who are doing the right thing and contributing to our country and still can't afford health insurance. The pregnant mother who's not getting proper prenatal care because she can't afford to see the OBGYN. The child whose asthma is neglected because her parents cannot afford her inhalators. In this context, CHA pushed, not for any one of the specific pieces of legislat legislative proposals that were out there, but for action based on principles. Too many presidents, dating all the way back to Truman, tried and failed to build the healthcare system we deserve. Our position was that the wait could go on no longer, 
that change was imperative and should come soon. A few months after I spoke to the City Club, the election brought to office a new president and a new opportunity to talk about health reform. This conversation has never been easy, and it wasn't easy this time. When President Obama pledged to repair the health care system, he reopened a debate that has been difficult for our country each and every time we've had it. This issue touches on our core political and constitutional values. It raises sometimes competing ideals of liberty and equality, individualism and community, and the prospect of change can be scary. For those with good insurance, why rock the boat? The perception has often been made that what is made available to someone else takes something away from me. That, among other factors, makes this topic the contentious one that it is. As the ACA legislation was being written and debated, we saw these factors play out in dramatic and even ugly ways. Remember the August 2009 town meeting? When people were coming to town meetings armed? When they were screaming at friends and neighbors instead of soberly discussing how we could move forward together? There was a political street fight, and misinformation was the deadliest weapon. During the debate over ACA, it wasn't small factual errors or misunderstandings that fueled the coverage, and often it wasn't honest disagreements about policy or approach. Unfortunately, some opponents of reform successfully manipulated the dialogue with misinformation and even outright lies. We were told that a government panel would arbitrarily end grandma's life. We were sold falsehoods about socialism and government-controlled health care. We were asked to believe that if the ACA became law, our freedom would be sacrificed and our national values threatened. The opposition was organized and it was effective, but it did not ultimately succeed in derailing the greatest expansion of health care access since Medicare was passed and, in, and enacted in 1965. The Affordable Care Act passed both houses of Congress and was signed by the President on March 23, 2010. It reflected, in large measure, the values and principles we named in CHA's vision document. The law is not perfect, and we never claimed it was. It is, however, a major step forward in creating a just and compassionate health care system we can afford and be proud of. It is a foundation on which we can build, learning what works and what doesn't, to lower cost, reduce waste, improve quality, and most effectively broaden access. Keep in mind, too, that the vast majority of the newly insured people in this program will get their coverage from private insurance companies. Now that the ACA is law and has survived a Supreme Court challenge in a way none of us would have predicted, in fact, at CHA, we call the, Supreme, the Chief Justice of the Supreme Court St. John Roberts now. <laughs> Uh, it certainly survived that challenge in a way none of us predicted, but there's still a lot of work to do. I'll go through just a few of the big areas that will require our careful attention. As you know, one of the law's features is the state-based insurance exchanges. The exchanges will be the way we facilitate coverage for many small businesses, as well as individuals, who now do not get it from their employer or a federal program. Each exchange will function much like the Expedia Travel uh, site does for travel, where consumers, in this case patients, will enter their information on a secure website. They will get to look at insurance options, they will put in their family and financial status, and will be shown several options for meaningful and affordable coverage, including the amount of the subsidy they will be able to get from the federal government if they're the low-income working poor. 
within the exchange, there will be these subsidies for those persons who don't qualify for Medicaid but couldn't afford coverage, independent insurance coverage on their own. Varying levels of subsidy will be available for those earning between 133% and 400% of the federal poverty level, which for a family of four is between 30,000 and 92,000. The exchanges will be open to small businesses who often struggle in the current environment to afford the coverage they want to offer because they don't get the volume discounts provided to the much larger employers. The goal of the exchanges is, to, is that a combination of more reasonable pricing, employer tax in incentives, and individual subsidies will result in 16 million more of our neighbors insured in private insurance programs. States that choose not to establish their own exchange will have one set up for them by the federal government. Right now, fewer than 20 states are building an exchange, but there will be one in every state. And getting to that point will not be simple. For many exchange states, the exchanges are going to require new infrastructure and information technology to build systems that are accessible, transparent, and effective. They will also need to be properly governed with oversight that assures that practices and policies within the exchanges are fair and lawful. In Ohio, your legislature introduced a bill at the beginning of its 2012 session to establish a state-run insurance exchange. The bill has not yet passed, and Governor John Kasich, meanwhile, has said Ohio prefers a state-run exchange but has not begun setting one up. I believe it is imperative for states, including Ohio, to make a decision on this as soon as possible and then immediately begin the work of building the exchange. As I mentioned, states that opt not to run their own exchange will have it run by the federal government, so there will be an exchange one way or another. As you might have seen recently, even some Republicans, like Senate Majority Leader Bill Fritz, former Senator Majority Leader Bill Fritz, have come out in favor of exchanges, saying they are a market-driven way to offer affordable health insurance to those who cannot afford it on their own. In an editorial, he wrote, for Nation magazine, the majority leader said that, there, that exchanges are originally a Republican idea that will allow states to be laboratories of democracy and develop their own approach to how exchanges work. Fritz also ordered, or urged reluctant states to get on board and begin building exchanges on their own because time is precious. I know that the Sisters of Charity Health System has been working with other hospitals and healthcare consumer groups toward consensus around a state-based exchange. And I encourage Governor Kasich to reconnect with this good work and try to move the exchange forward. Exchanges are just one of the law's provisions to be carried out in the next couple years. Medicaid will be a challenge, too. The Supreme Court ruled that the Medicaid expansion envisioned by the ACA is not mandatory for states, but an option, which has prompted several state governors to say they will not opt in. Many have predicted that eventually all states will decide to join the expansion for a couple reasons. First, it is funded by the federal government at 100% until 2016, and at 90% for newly, enrolled, uh, newly eligible enrollees in the years after that. And second, you are likely to see significant pressure from people in those states to fortify the Medicaid program especially as the economy continues to be a challenge for so many working Americans. In addition to the humanitarian reason for accepting the expanded Medicaid, there are serious economic reasons. First, the cost of the care of the uninsured gets passed on to the hospital, insurance companies, employers, and individuals. When that cost for millions could be eliminated, 
there is no excuse for not doing the Medicaid expansion. Increasing the economic health of hospitals, businesses, and families increases the economic health of the state as well. It is also important to note that hospitals took a $155 billion cut in reimbursements predicated on getting 30 to 32 million people who are now uninsured on the insured rolls. We simply cannot afford to observe, absorb those costs without the corresponding number of newly insured people. Education and enrollment will be absolutely crucial as we move toward implementing this law. It is always a big task to ensure that those people who are eligible for Medicaid or the exchange subsidies are able to enroll in those programs. This will take a massive education and awareness effort that includes advertising, coalition work, and participation from schools, churches, community organizations, and others. I encourage all of you to help inform your colleagues and friends about these new benefits. The best laws and benefits we can come up with are no good if people are unaware of them or have trouble accessing them. There are still many known and unknown changes and corrections that will need to happen to make the, the program a success. This should not surprise us. Look at how many changes we have made to the original Medicare program, and it is today the most popular and effective healthcare program in our country. Finally, a word about misinformation. As I mentioned earlier, the bad or misleading information has been very damaging and is, in my view, the main reason that only half of the public says they support the law. In fact, though, if you look deeper into public opinion surveys, you find the vast majority of Americans support the major provisions of the law from no more pre-existing condition exclusions in obtaining insurance to the state insurance exchanges to benefit those working for small businesses to the expansion of Medicaid. We see support when we, when we drill down. Resistance to the law is apparently based on many of the myths we've heard perpetrated and not based on actual facts. Small business owners, for instance, are reportedly anti-Affordable Care Act because the law is supposed to be killing jobs and costing them money. The fact is that ACA can only help small businesses by providing tax credits that help offset the cost of providing insurance to their workers. Companies across the country have already received the tax credit. And some have even been able to hire additional workers because of the savings. Businesses with fewer than 50 employees have no obligation under the ACA, but a lot of potential upside, including the tax credit and the ability to purchase coverage through the exchanges once they are up and running, which will give small businesses many of the same economic advantages when they are buying insurance that are now enjoyed by large corporations. At CHA, as, and as part of the effort to combat the bad information, we have been working to tell the stories of real people helped by the Affordable Care Act. Two of our stories come from small businesses, an auto repair shop owner in Portland, Oregon, and a record shop owner in St. Louis. Both have already received substantial tax credits and look forward to more stability in their premiums once the exchanges are operational. They also speak in compelling terms about why they chose to offer health insurance in the first place and how grateful they are for the help now being offered by the Affordable Care Act. We also have stories of seniors, children, young adults, and others who have benefited from the law. 
You can see and share these vignettes by visiting youtube.com Health Reform Works. I would encourage you to watch and pass along these stories. Because one thing we have found is that when people, that people better understand the implications of something as complex as health reform, when they hear it from their peers, from others who are like them and can explain it in human terms. I remember finishing a talk like this at a university and a woman who worked for the university who, if you just looked at her, well-educated well and a good job, came up to me and said, those two things that you talked about have already changed the life of our family. She said, my husband has MS and he has it very badly. My daughter has cerebral palsy and she has it very badly. She said, we're going, for both of them, they're going to hit the, the upper limit and then we'll be on our own to cover insurance costs or to cover medical costs. And if I change insurances, both of them, because of their pre-existing condition, will be covered for everything but what they need uh, insurance for most. So just knowing that, that the limit in coverage has been taken off and that the pre-existing condition for children is already off and will be off for adults in 2014 had made the, a total difference in their life. They can go on now planning their life without worrying every day what's going to happen uh, when they hit the, the limit. And when you talk to people like that, people understand the importance of, of a good insurance program for every American. For all of us who've been active in health reform, this has been a long journey. And the journey continues. As we continue to work ahead, I encourage all of you to stay involved and informed. To ask questions when something doesn't make sense. And make sure you're getting accurate and up-to-date information. As I mentioned at the beginning of my remarks, the Affordable Care Act is not a perfect law, but it is a tremendous beginning for getting coverage for all. It is a law that respects life. It is a law that matches Catholic and American principles for fairness and compassion. Along with CHA's members and other groups, we will continue to work to improve upon it, to educate people about it, and most of all, for making the benefits inherent in this new law available to our brothers and sisters in this country who have such a great need for the law. Thank you so much for having me here today and for your kind attention. Today at the City Club of Cleveland, we are listening to an Encore Speakers Forum featuring Sister Carol Keehan, President and Chief Executive Officer of Catholic Health Association of the United States. We will return to Sister Carol in a minute for the traditional City Club questions. We urge you to uh, formulate your questions now and remind you that your questions should be brief and to the point so we can get as many in as possible. We would like to welcome today guests at tables hosted by Baker and Hostetler, the Cleveland Clinic, Deloitte Tax LLP, Medical Mutual, and Sisters of Charity Health System. Thank you all for your support. And today's program is sponsored by Sisters of Charity Health System. Joining us today at the head table is Sister Judith Ann Karam, President and Chief Executive Officer of Sisters of Health. Sister Judith, will you please stand and be recognized? Thank you very much for your support. Today's program is the Cyrus Eaton Memorial Foundation, made possible by a generous gift from the Cyrus Eaton Foundation. Now we would like to return to our speaker for our traditional City Club question and answer period. We welcome questions from everyone, including guests. Holding the microphones today is City Club 100th Anniversary Assistant Director Betsy Wallace and City Club Program Director Carrie Miller. First question, please. 
Sister Key, and toward the end of your remarks, you suggested that we might look for accurate and up-to-date information on the health care law. Where do we go to find that information? I find TV ads from the political parties to be uh, somewhat skewed, so <laughs> where does the average guy go and, or and gal to learn this stuff? And you have the luck to live stuff? in Ohio. <laughs> That's a swing state, so you're going to get more than your share of those ads. Uh, <coughs> you can go to healthcare.gov, the, the health reform uh, website. You can go to the CHA website and get some links there uh, that will be very helpful that explain the, the, what the uh, uh, Health Reform Act is all about. And we'll get, I mean, there's some just crazy stuff that, that circulates. Uh, <coughs> the latest crazy thing I heard was on page such and such, there's a provision that allows, uh, that forces everyone to comply with the act but Muslims. I mean, the, the, the level of the, of the misinformation and the lies is crazy. So I would encourage you to go to healthcare.gov. <laughs> The Commonwealth Fund has some great information. Um, on healthcare.gov, you can look state by state, and you can see already how many people in the state of Ohio have been helped. How many of your Medicare recipients have gotten uh, pre preventive services without any copay? How many, um, men, how many uh, have gotten a, a prescription funding for the donut hole? And, and all of those kinds of things. So it's a, they're, they're specific information from the bill, uh, and they're, they're not trying to sell you anything. Uh, Sister Keehan, you mentioned the major changes that have occurred since you last spoke here at the City Club about four years ago, and certainly have been monumental in the healthcare field. Uh, in addition, there have been many, many changes in the world in this past four years. Uh, entire governments of the Middle East have changed, and. Uh, uh, to, to, to sort of semi-democracies and all that kind of thing. I'm wondering, you hold a unique position as the head of the uh, very important Catholic organization in this country. And I'm thinking about the Vatican and some of the attitudes that the Vatican has had that seem to be oh, maybe somewhat outdated today. Uh, for example, the uh, ordination of women as priests, uh, perhaps the area of uh, uh, birth control, maybe the uh, attitude towards uh, civil rights for gays. Uh, what do you feel are the possibilities of some similar changes occurring in the Vatican in the forthcoming years? You're going to have to pay me to answer that question. <laughs> uh, actually, w one of the things I need to say right up front is in many ways, the Vatican's greatest deficit is its press, uh, its handling of public relations. And, and they've just made a major effort to try to improve that. Um, I, I certainly think that all of us as mem who are members of the Catholic Church, and those who aren't, but who admire the impact that the Church can have, you, know, you can look at those things which do get a lot of attention and sometimes make us cringe a bit particularly in the way they're said, um, and at the same time also look at the great work done in this country by many of the Catholic organizations, by Catholic Relief Services, one of the largest organizations in the world for international relief, major partner with the United States government. I would say the important thing, because we need to be people of hope, the church is slow to change. I mean, they just had an exhibit in Rome that I went to uh, and one of the things they showed was the trial of Galileo and all the official documents. Um, and, uh, you know, that was many centuries ago, and they just finally said we were wrong. So it, <laughs> it, it sometimes progress is slow. Um, but, but there is progress, and we are people of hope. And, and at the same time, we need to look at the other side, that where so much good is being done by the church. Um, but, but it is important. For those of us who deal with those issues every day and know the power and influence the church can be for good, continue to raise that concern with the church. Sister Kian, my name is Michael Dover. I'm a social worker and I'm an advocate of universal health access. I share your optimism for the exchanges. We've seen how that works with federal employees with the, with the Medicare prescription drugs. Uh, I'm not sure I share your 
your view that the people will be clamoring to be on Medicaid, people between 100 and 135 or 138 percent of the poverty line, depending on that, are going to be that uh, encouraged to buy that. I wonder what you thought about the pros and cons uh, of permitting the states or the Secretary Sebelius making it clear that the federal government would welcome waiver proposals from the states to fully fund the participation of people between 100 and 133 percent of the poverty line in the exchanges with the coinsurance and premiums and deductibles waived uh, so that fewer people are constantly going off the exchanges onto Medicaid and vice versa. Uh, and what would you see as the pros and cons of such a, uh, a Medicaid waiver uh, capability? Uh, I, I don't know the legal potential that the Secretary has under the bill to do that dramatic a waiver because the bill is pretty specific. And I often say to people, it isn't the bill I would have written. It's not the bill any one person would have written. It was a, it was a sausage-making mess, uh, believe me. Um, and, and, and so the good news for you is that the portals that are being developed right now, and those are the things to help people get on to the exchange or get on to the expanded Medicaid or the current Medicaid and be able to stay on it. And if you're a social worker, you know how long it takes to get a person on Medicaid and then you know, reauthorized on Medicaid. That can be just devastating. The, I've been watching over the past year, and CHA has been a partner in what we call Enroll America. Uh, and there have been about 12 states and four insurance companies that worked with um, some think tanks, and they have gone to the states all the states looked at what people are doing. They have worked very hard because it, with the exchanges, we have a real problem. 70% of small business are under 10 employees. So the guy who is at the gas station fixing your tire and changing your oil is the president and CEO and the HR director. So he's not going to be able to do a lot of that. So we have to make it easy for him and easy for his employees. The Medicaid people, people aren't going to clamor to have a Medicaid card. I, I recognize some of the, the stress that comes and, and, and the lack of dignity sometimes that comes with being a Medicaid card recipient. But there's good evidence today that it, the difference between no Medicaid and Medicaid is profound in the life and health of, of a, a family and particularly in the life and health of the children. And so while they won't they, everybody that gets a Medicaid card would much rather have an insurance card. At least it's a first start. And it's also a start for that family in being insured. Maybe they're not, as in, maybe they're not insured with Aetna or United or Blue Cross, but they're insured. And that's for a family that have lived generations without any insurance. That's a first step. The fact that they're both going to be on the same kinds of portals, that have used the same uh, engine to drive them to coverage, uh, well, that will be very helpful because we will learn a great deal. And we will learn if it's possible and if it's a better way to go at it to do it all through an insurance company. So there's hope that, they will, that people will, um, that will learn a lot. And as we learn it, we can improve the program. Um, it, and you're right, people don't always see it as a, as a very dignified thing to have a Medicaid card, and sometimes they're not treated with great dignity. But it's better than nothing at all when you have children and, and they're sick. So, um, you know, it is, it's a step forward. It isn't where we want to get in the end. Sister Carol, in the public debate, there is a lot of talk about $700 billion in Medicare cuts. Would you explain more about these cuts? Yeah. Who was that one that said about these ads that are out there? <laughs> um, yes, I, I'd be happy to. The, one of the ways we were able, one of the goals in health, the Affordable Care Act was not only to find more people insured, but to make sure that the best insurance product we have in this nation today, Medicare, had a longer life. And so part of the building of the Affordable Care Act was to do things that also helped the Medicare program to be, have a much longer, the, the trust fund have a lot more money in it and not to, actually not to spend the money so fast so that the trust fund would last a lot longer. 
So part of working with providers like ourselves, like hospitals, like um, uh, pharmaceutical groups, like um, uh, medical device people, was to say, wait a minute, if you're going to have a lot more people who are insured, who are going to be able to buy your product, you need to be helpful for this effort. And so hospitals took uh, $155 billion in reductions in what we would ordinarily get in our annual increases over a period of years in order to be able to uh, create the, the entire Affordable Care Act. Pharmaceutical companies did something, medical device, lots of, lots of people played into that. What that did was say that we will spend the money in the Medicare trust fund slower. And if you spend money slower, it lasts longer. So there wasn't money taken out of the Medicare trust fund that we, we are going to spend it slower. And there certainly wasn't any benefit reduction either in the amount of time it can be used or how often it can be used for, for Medicare recipients. We would have never been a part of that. Um, so that's a very important distinction. The, the, other, you know, the other distinction would be that um, the other way of getting it out that's, that's potentially being proposed was if, if we get to a certain age group uh, becomes Medicare eligible, after a certain date in this country, you'd no longer just be Medicare eligible once you'd signed up because of all the money you'd paid in. You would now get what, what people are calling premium support. It was vo vouchers, now they're calling it premium support. And every year, Medicare recipients would have to look at a, at a plethora of options and pick again an insurance product. We have to look at, at what that does and the insecurity that that creates um, I know there have been a lot of studies that say not only would it create insecurity and, and stress, but you would be paying a lot more out of pocket to, to have the same coverage you have today or even close to it. So uh, I, I, I will tell you, in the Affordable Care Act, nothing was taken away, and a great deal of effort went into um, keeping that Medicare trust fund solvent for much longer. Sister, there appear to be uh, many people of low and moderate income who are employed, who have employer-provided health insurance, who are paying increasing amounts uh, of copays and deductibles and, and part of the, the premiums. Will people like that who have gaps in their coverage and problems with affordability be able to benefit from the exchanges? Absolutely. Many, many people will be able to benefit from the exchanges. Um, you know, at right now it's at 100 employees, and then we'll go. It'll go up and up. And once you see that something works, guess what? We can we can talk to people like the congresswoman and say, <laughs> enlarge it. <laughs> and, when, and so that's that's a whole um, uh, big thing because right now those small employers who are buying insurance are are doing it at much greater expense than the large employers. And to keep it, often they're having to do high deductibles and high copays. That we should be able to, to, to deal with um, in a much, much better way. The other thing that's going to help that I didn't talk about in this uh, uh, short half hour that I had is the, the law mandates that every insurance company must spend 80 to 85 percent of what it takes in for medical care and quality improvement. And if they don't, they've got to pay that money back. And we're in the midst right now of a lot of insurance companies across this country paying people back. Um, one of the things I said when I was here before in 2008 is we have to make it so that it is better to be uh, an insured person by an insurance company than a stockholder of that insurance company. And that provision in the law is going to reduce costs of insurance to employers and employees. I didn't want to. Uh, OK. Uh, sister, first of all, thank you for your life's work. And thank you for coming here to Cleveland. Thank, thank you. you for coming back to Cleveland. 
My question is, could you please enlighten us on your views of the issue of religious liberty that has come up <laughs> in some circles uh, and uh, how you view the execution of that concern uh, in the months ahead uh, as part of the health care reform? You're going to owe me big time. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, <laughs> um, I, I'm sure that um, many of you have seen and, and have been concerned about the, the issue of the mandate. First of all, let me say the mandate for women's preventive services is basically a magnificent idea. It says that no woman will be prevented or have an obstacle to getting preventive health care because she has a high copay or a high deductible. She'll get mammograms, colonoscopies, primary care, um, annual checkups, all of those things without a copay and without meeting a high deductible. You know, probably no one in this room would be kept from having a mammogram or a colonoscopy for a $20 copay. Now the prep might do it, but the $20 copay <laughs> wouldn't. But for many women who wait on us, $20 is the difference between the last meals of the last two days before payday or they're filling their children's prescription. And so again, they put off their mammogram. They put off going to the doctor for an annual physical because People take care of their family first. And so the bulk of the women's preventive services and what should be in that were recommended to the secretary by the Institute of Medicine. They were recommended as things every woman in this country should have without any obstacles. The one they included that gave a little bit of challenge or maybe a big bit of challenge was contraception and sterilization. And Many uh, of us who are Catholic have, because of the church's teaching, b always bought our health insurance without contraception in it, following the church's teaching. We anticipated a waiver, uh, and I'm not going to give you the, 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 the many months story of this. We did not get a waiver. At this point, we have a process going on which I think we should honor. I know that if you, if you think health reform's got a lot of people saying things that batter you from both sides, try, try Googling this issue. Right now, we, the waiver, the um, law came into effect in August, August 1st. So you, employers have to cover those things in their insurance plans. The government in its regulations made a distinction between churches and ministries of churches, um, somewhat similar to the distinction that is made between who files a 990 and who doesn't. A church doesn't, but a Catholic hospital, Catholic university will. Unfortunately, the way they described it was that if you were um, a ministry of the church to qualify for the total exemption or a waiver, you had to serve only Catholics or primarily only Catholics, hire primarily only Catholics, and what was the other thing? Oh, be evangelizing. That was, and I mean, you know, the Sisters of Charity system here. You know, Catholic charities here. Those are not, um, that, that's not what they do. And so there's been a lot of talk back and forth, people on both sides of this issue. Um, the president has said very publicly, I gave a year waiver for the ministries, the hospitals, the universities, et cetera, so that we will have the time to talk this through and try to come to a resolution that honors the values and deeply held beliefs of people on all sides of this. We have from the HHS, they published a notice of an intent to publish regulations. We have given a response to them and in, people have said, well, CHA said they wouldn't take the waiver the president offered. I said, no. What we said was the best way to fix it is this way. The president now has on the table 
that insurance companies and TPAs would have to cover uh, for the self-insured would have to cover these services, but the Catholic employer would not have to provide them, refer for them, or pay for them, um, or negotiate for them. And so basically, there's still some difference of opinion, and this is a very heated moment in politics, and we have a year. We are staying in dialogue. We intend, we, we've been in dialogue with the Secretary, and we've been in dialogue with the White House, and we will stay in dialogue trying to get, I think there are a lot of people of great goodwill with a lot of respect for deeply held values, even if you don't agree with the deeply held value, yet people have respect for it. And so we are very hopeful that we will be able to work something out on this issue that is reasonable for both sides. Thank you for that very balanced discussion of a tender issue. Um, you mentioned early on seven principles, and you've spoken with enthusiasm about how the Affordable Care Act has uh, honored many of them. Which one of your principles is least well served today and that you would most like to draw to our attention as something that you hope will shape what happens in the future? Covering everybody. Um, uh, you know, we believe that people need to get the care they need. Um, our, our church teaching on this is very clear, from the Vatican to the United States Conference of Catholic Bishops. It's a deeply held American sense of uh, care for each other. I mean, just put a story in the newspaper about a child that needs care, or you know, a person, an elderly person or something, and you see America respond. The pain that people deal with, and, and the Institute of Medicine tells us every year in this country we have 18,000 unnecessary deaths because people don't get care. They don't get colonoscopies, they don't get mammograms, they have blood in their urine and they don't follow up on it, all kinds of things until they, it's too late. And so we have 18,000 unnecessary deaths. We, are, we have 50 million people in this country who are uninsured who um, are American. We have a lot of immigrants who make it very possible for us to live a very comfortable life. They're not covered in it either. So that would clearly be the major piece. Having said that, if I can move from 50 un million uninsured to 20 million uninsured, that is a great first step. And if we can show how it can be done, we would really like to do that. Um, and we would like to take that first step. And then we'll be back on uh, Representative <laughs> Captor's front door for the other 20. <laughs> and you owe me. <laughs> uh, oh, excuse me, yes. Sister, thank you again very much. Um, two quick questions. They're not simple answers, I know. I'm, as a psychiatrist, I can speak to the woeful inadequacy <laughs> for years of coverage for any type of mental health Absolutely. condition or illness. And I'm interested to know how does, if that's addressed in this bill and in what way. My second question is, um, assuming the, if our Republican candidate is elected and does as he promised, which is to do away with Obamacare, what do you think will happen then? Um. You're absolutely right. The mentally ill are among our most vulnerable and least well cared for. Um, there are some aspects of this bill that are helpful. You know, there was the parity bill that was passed. We are a long way to go for parity. And so many of our uninsured, I mean, our, our mentally ill, are uninsured and don't have the um, ability at this point to deal with getting registered and, you know, walking through all those uh, things. So. We have got to, as a people, find a more creative way to deal with mental health illnesses. And, you know, quite honestly, again, if you can, if you can take a huge percentage of people and get them covered, we ought to be able to put some energy around that. There are some things in the bill that, are, that in, in, my, in, in my feeling, are very pro-life about medical judgments. The, the bill explicitly forbids medical judgments being made in medical decisions 
about people based on what we perceive as quality of life issues. You know, been schizophrenic for 20 years, um, mentally handicapped, and, and they need a kidney replacement or they need a, a heart surgery. The bill explicitly forbids making judgments on those kinds of things. So there are some efforts to, to try to get closer, but I would have to tell you, uh, I don't have to tell you, you could tell me a million stories. We haven't gotten there. As to what I think will happen, I, I would be heartbroken, and, and I think so will our country. Today at the City Club of Cleveland, we have been listening to a special Encore Speakers Forum featuring Sister Carol Keehan. Thank you very much, Sister Carol. You were wonderful. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. This forum is now adjourned. For information on upcoming speakers or for podcasts of the City Club, go to cityclub.org. is proud to support the presentation of this City Club of Cleveland Friday Forum on WVIZ PBS. Additional support comes from Cleveland State University. Support for closed caption transcripts